Ben did a great job yesterday of pulling down all the string lines and smoothing things up, recompacting the edges that had gotten raveled. And so today we're going to finish backfilling the hole we dug for the sewer, start spreading out visqueen, six mil visqueen as a vapor barrier between the subgrade and the fine grade, and then start spreading the mix of three quarter minus and beach sand, which we ended up with that we're gonna use to put the top exact fine grade over what was rough before and then compact it prior to placing rebar. How about that? Abraham is 10 years old and he's probably operated this thing a total of an hour. But I knew he could do that because he knows how to focus his attention. I only had to tell him once that when somebody gets into the kill zone, you get your hands off the control. And I've been watching him and he does it. He's a very serious minded boy. And that is what gave me the confidence to use him in order to facilitate a task that I really couldn't have done by myself. So here's a question, Abraham. What was it like doing this job with this excavator this morning, moving that whacker in and out? What was that like? It's scary, but now I realize that everything I do could kill somebody or break a house or something like that. <laughs> so how many 10-year-olds come to that realization that there are things that you can do that are scary and that could kill somebody or break a house? I hope he can hang on to that as he enters into his teenage years and young adulthood because a lot of times boys just don't get that until maybe it's too late, right? But this kid, way to go, man. Six mil visqueen, vapor barrier under the slab to stop the, the vapor in the soil from keeping the concrete wet and the top of the concrete damp underfoot. It's important to do that in a building. It is important to not do it outside in concrete that's exposed to the weather because it really complicates freeze-thaw problems when you're when you sort of are capturing and anyway, don't use it outside, use it inside and pay attention to the size roll you get because it's expensive now and you can usually get it in various sizes that will translate to a reasonable use in your building. 12 inches of overlap on the seams. Some people tape them, I don't. Here we go. I'm putting the fine grade in here with a mixture of three quarter minus and beach sand. That's because Umpqua Sand and Gravel had a pile of contaminated beach sand that they were getting rid of and it was there and it, the price was right and I just grabbed some of it and brought it back. Makes it a funny color, but that's all right. It stands up, it makes the rock, the bigger rock easier to grade. It pokes fewer holes or makes fewer indentations in the um, vapor barrier underneath. So we're just about done. I don't have quite enough. We'll have to make one more little run for just a little bit of, you know, little bit of material to finish up the grading down on that end. I'm going to plate tamp what we've got here, probably call it a day, and then uh, finish th this up tomorrow and start tying some rebar. Rebar placement is never going to be seen again. Once the concrete's in place, it's buried forever or until the building is torn out. But that doesn't mean that the layout should be sloppy, particularly in the clearance from the ground and the clearance to the top. The rebar needs to be in the right place inside the concrete. It also needs to be in the right location. And so I use marking paint, upside down marking paint, and paint the layout on the, sla on the pad, right on the dirt, in exactly the same way that I put pencil marks on bottom plates. The mat needs to be spaced evenly. It needs to look good, it needs to be good. The inspector needs to be relaxed when he walks up and looks at your mat. So I'm gonna put some paint marks on the ground to make it easy to drop the rebar exactly where it needs to be. The order of business today is to kick these forms off, that is make sure they're braced and perfectly straight so I don't have to think about that ever again. We'll be using turnbuckles and square concrete stakes and screws and nails and making sure that they are exactly where we need them to be. And then we're gonna start tying rebar. I have number four bars scattered around the perimeter. That's the, the longitudinal bars in the bottom of the footing. 
They will be put on three inch wire dobies. I'll show you some details on that very soon. But in the meantime, before it gets hot, I need to get busy, brace these forms in place and start in putting the tensile strength into the concrete using a rebar. What you're watching me do here is a very leisurely approach to getting ready for a concrete pour or even just to get ready to tie the rebar. It's leisurely because there's no pressure associated with the schedule here. It's just a lovely summer and I'm happy to be working here at the Brewster's place. But in the real world of construction that you're going to confront if you're not there already, the last day of setup, the day before the inspection, the day before the truck arrives is just as pressure packed as the day that the concrete shows up because you've got to get ready. The trucks are scheduled, the manpower is scheduled, the pump is booked, and you've got to have it ready to roll with no problems. If you don't, the problems will be much bigger after the concrete's in place. I'm out of turnbuckles. Doesn't matter because this bank is too close to get a turnbuckle in there anyway for adjusting this form. So I'm going to seriously overkill the kickers so I don't even have to think about whether there's been any movement on pour day. And then on pour day, as the bottom lift slides into the form, I'm going to kick a little dirt against the bottom just to make sure that the underpinning doesn't get pushed around or blows out or anything. So I'm going to put way too many kickers in here since I have them and we have time and I'm in the shade and I will just cross that off my list next week when we start putting the mud in here. First part of tying the rebar in here is to make the cuts so that once you are tying you don't have to come back and cut and stack, you know, stock and scatter your material. You try to get everything scattered that you can. That's part of efficiency in construction. And that includes today making some cuts with this rebar cutter bender on some number four bar that's half inch diameter, 60 grade rebar. And it cuts hard, hard. And there is actually, in my experience, an OSHA issue here. And that is the last part of this cut on a 180 pound guy, by the way, I'm down to about 185 right now. I mean, I'm not bragging, I'm not complaining, it's just reality. But uh, the last part of this cutting process can actually hurt your neck. So I try to do it like this. First part is a pull. Can't hurt you. Get close. Second part, you get on top of it, and then when it snaps, your head tries to remain where it was a microsecond before. And so you just got to be ready for the whip of it. So just like everything else, and perhaps more than some aspects of construction, staging your rebar is uh, really important in <laughs> the whole contest between whether it's just a nightmare or just a struggle. And so in this one, I tied the longitudinal bars, actually Asher and I tied the longitudinal bars first, including getting them up on the dobies, the wired um, little concrete blocks, three inch dobies. Want three inches of clearance below the bottom of the longitudinal bars. I threw a few little transverse bars, that's bars across, just to tie that apart. So when I'm walking down through here and I'm stepping in and, and kicking those bottom bars, they're not falling over. That's important. Got the template up, which is this two by four, an inch and a half above the grade so that Dustin and Tom can run the points of their, of their uh, magnesium floats underneath there so I don't have a big ugly line to lay the block over. All these things sort of add up to either efficient use of time and um, a reasonable construction schedule or not. So now with the template and these bottom bars in, I can stand these J bars, these hook bars, which are 40 inches on this leg and 12 inches on this leg. I can stand them up, tie them in well enough that they'll stay there during the concrete pour and be in the right place when I need to lay block on them. here is we're taking the shower pan for the actual shower that's going in here and making very very sure that we know exactly where the drain is we're gonna have to move that two inch line just a little bit easy to do at this point almost impossible to do later so there's you know a picture is worth a thousand words the actual item is worth a volume so we're gonna actually drive a stake when that drain opening is in the right spot and then Ben and his boys will know how to expose that drain put maybe a 45 degree angle on that two inch drain line 
and bring it over within reaching distance of the P-trap that has to be installed underneath the shower pan. So this 2x4 template is set on this side an inch and a half above the concrete so that they can trowel underneath of it. On this little short stretch on the side, it doesn't matter. The first vert is four inches from the outside of concrete in both directions, which will put it in the center of a cell. Each vert after that is 16 inches on center down that wall and 32 inches on center down this wall so that each one ends up in the center of a cell. Super important. There are the wire dobies keeping the clearance three inches minimum. Little transverse bars just for ease of assembly. The J bars, the hook bars, the verts, all named for the same thing, are in place all the way down. We have a couple little issues, really just one. We have a clearance to the dirt that's only about an inch and a half. We'll save that for the inspector to point out. And we have right here, rebar in contact with the dirt. That also will be pointed out at inspection. And my grandsons can climb down there and clean it out. So this first part is taken care of. Now we will just lay out the mat, the number three bar, 24 inches on center, all the way across the middle of this thing, tie it off, get it up on inch and a half dobies, and be ready to call for an inspection once the hold downs are in place. Lay that in your hand and just tap it from the back. I'll find you a little lighter hammer. Yeah, like that, like that. And you can bring them out. And... Oh, the rebar is just about done. We've got to tie this mat that's in the floor. We have to install the stab bolts, the hold downs, uh, the HD5s that are going to happen in about 10 places around the perimeter. But first of all, before it gets warm this morning, we're just going to put our head down and tie this mat. A 50% tie is standard, industry standard, perhaps even code compliant, I would say. And that means 50% of the intersections in a floor mat like this have to be tied. There are specifications about how many twists can be put into the wire and all that sort of thing, and I am not a rod buster, as you rod busters have already figured out. But the general concept is this. You have to be sure that the wire holds the rebar until the concrete holds the rebar. And as soon as the concrete has it, the wire is contributing nothing to the strength of your building. So the tying and the, the materials and the processes are all geared up to get it tied as quickly as you can, as strongly as it needs to be tied. Looking forward to the day that the tensile strength of the rebar is contributed to the overall strength of the concrete. There are two um, methods we're using here. Now these little spinners, I don't know how long they've been around. I usually don't use them, but I'm glad to have them today because I have some grandsons who would never be able to help me much at all if they were having to use pliers and a wire reel. The wire comes pre-bent, cut to length by as much as you think you're going to need, plus a little. You grab them, you put a little U-shaped bend, you come underneath your single tie, you slip the ends of the spinner through those eyes you hold a lot of tension, you pull back hard, and you wind it down until hopefully just before it's gonna break off and push it down below the grade, and that's a wire tie. Doesn't take long, and this is about the only place it makes sense. Now on the other hand, when you have a wire reel, and you're gonna do a single tie, you just reach under, grab it, pull tight, give it a twist, grab it, give it a twist and a pull, and cut it off. Now that may or may not be something that a rod buster would put his initials to, but it works pretty good. These are wired dobies. 
there are little blocks of concrete that hold the rebar up where it needs to be when the concrete hits the ground. These are two inches square by an inch and a half tall. The inch and a half dimension is the critical dimension because it holds this rebar mat halfway between the grade at the bottom and the top of the concrete, which is pretty much where it needs to be. And it needs to be there in such a way that when they're walking around out here pouring, they're not able to push the rebar down to the dirt and the rebar doesn't float or come up or stick above the level of the top of the concrete, which is where the really critical work is happening. I'm gonna scatter these things out on what looks like about the right spacing. We're gonna tie the wires at the intersections of the bar and then come back out and tie the balance. So there's about a 50% tie on this mat. Well, the inspector was pleased with what we had set up here. And once everything was passed off, I was able to schedule three truckloads of concrete, Brothers Concrete Pumping and Dustin Furch and his crew for a classic turn down edge monolithic slab pour on a hot summer day. That's coming up next on our Shop Build series. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.